The gospel is exclusive. There is exclusivity to the gospel. But the gospel is also inclusive. Right? So there is both exclusivity and inclusivity to the gospel. The inclusivity is that anyone can accept it, but the exclusivity is that it's only if you accept it that you are saved. Now, last week we talked about representing the gospel well by your actions, by your works. That's not what saves you, right? That's not how your sins are forgiven, good works outweighing the bad. However, your good works positively and your bad works negatively usually have an impact on how others perceive Jesus. If you represent him poorly, why would they want him? Right? Because, you know, if, yeah, if you represent him badly, they don't want what you represent badly. But if you represent him well, it definitely at least improves their chances of accepting him because it makes Christ more favorable in their eyes. Now, ultimately, right, it's God who changes hearts, not us. God can bring people to himself despite us. But how horrible a thing it is when Christians push people from the Lord through their actions. It seems like that's happening in a subtle way in the event that we read about in today's passage. It's talking about the Apostle Peter, who here is called Cephas, and his time in Antioch, the Syrian Antioch, which you can kind of think of as pretty much Paul's sending church. Uh, it was kind of home base for Paul for a while. So Paul and Peter, Cephas, are there, and this is what Paul describes as happening. This is Galatians 2, again, 11 to 14. But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, If you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? Lord, thank you so much for your word. Thank you so much for this time where we can go through it. And I just pray, Lord, that you would be with me as I speak, that if I say anything that might be wrong or untrue, that that would not be believed in the name of Jesus. I don't want to lead anyone astray. But also that we would take in your truths this morning. What is actually true, that we would take that in, that we would believe it, that we would understand it, that we would remember it in the name of Jesus. Work in this place to bring understanding to our minds in the name of Jesus. And work on all of our hearts as well here, as well. Challenging us where we might need to be challenged. And also encouraging us where we need to be encouraged in the name of Jesus. You're good in every way. And uh, we just want you to work here, Lord. This is your word. This is your truth. And uh, we want that to be what is proclaimed, what is spoken, and what is gotten across so that you are glorified and so that, you know, we can grow. So help those things to happen, Lord. Help us grow in this time in the name of Jesus. Help us remember these things. But also, of course, be glorified in the name of Jesus. Amen. The gospel fuels works. Like we've been saying throughout this whole book, being saved from hell and allowed into heaven to live with Christ forever is not based on works, right? You're saved by God's grace through a genuine faith in Christ. But that genuine faith in Christ produces good works. However, even as those who have repentant hearts, who, who genuinely believe in Christ, who trust in his death and resurrection, who hold him as Lord who are saved, we know we can still fall short of representing that gospel well. We're still in our sinful flesh. Inwardly, we've been transformed. We're new creations in Christ, but we're still affected by our sin nature. Our sin nature. Uh, temptations often work on us. Sin looks bad to us, but it also looks good to us. 
We're in the middle of this battle between the new creation and the old flesh. And we therefore find ourselves often misrepresenting Christ, misrepresenting the gospel, maybe not in words, but in our actions. We do that too often. There are so many times where our actions do not line up with the gospel. And in those times, there is opportunity for each of us to come along one to come alongside one another and say, hey, like, that's not right. That's not good what you're doing. We need to work on that. There's room for rebuke in a spirit of gentleness. Loving someone is not tolerating their sin. Loving someone is not just letting them do whatever they want. Loving someone is doing what you think is best for them. Now, are we misguided in our love sometimes? Do we sometimes think something is best for someone and then end up causing trouble for them? Yes. So we definitely need to, you know, pray for wisdom and study the scriptures well so we're not misapplying them. But oftentimes, rebuke is the path of love. Rebuke is the path of love. We need to be holding each other accountable so that we can grow in holiness, better representing Christ and his gospel for the sake of others who look at us as Christians and to better serve Christ for his honor, his glory, and his will. So far in Galatians, We've seen that the churches of Galatia are beginning to be swayed by a false works-based gospel. It's not that those swaying them are against Christ being the Messiah, but they preach a Christ plus works of the law gospel. At the very least, they're saying, hey, you need to be physically circumcised according to the law God gave Israel through Moses in order to be saved. Now, the people who are teaching this false gospel are likely those who think highly of Peter and the rest of the 12 apostles. I'd imagine they don't think very highly of the apostle Paul, who used to persecute their people, who's now going out to the Gentiles, eating with them and stuff like that. So you might get this sense of, well, hey, this guy Paul here, like he's not one of the 12. This guy was never with Jesus during his ministry. Peter and the Twelve, they spent three years with Jesus. That might be the kind of sense you're getting from these guys. And so what Paul has begun doing is he started telling his own story as an argument that he did not receive the gospel from men. That it's, as we've been saying, no man's gospel, but that, hey, the Lord Jesus did appear to him directly. And the gospel that he received was from Jesus himself. And what we see today is kind of this end point to the story that he's been telling, giving this emphasis of the Apostle Peter even falls short of doing a good job at representing the gospel that Christ gave. Even Peter falls short of that. You know, we saw Paul's humility first a few weeks ago, basically saying, well, even if I preach a gospel that's different to you, let me be accursed, even if I do it. And here, through Peter's um, actions, it's not Peter's preaching this time with words, but you see that his actions do not line up with that gospel. And as we see, Paul will rebuke him. Starting in verse 11, it says, but when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he was eaten with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. So James, as in James the Lord's brother, sends men to Antioch from the Jerusalem church. And among them are those who would hold to that false belief. You must be circumcised according to the Jewish law in order to be saved. A lot of people call them Judaizers. It's like they want to make the Gentiles into Jews. Judaizers. Peter is then afraid of these men and decides to stop eating with the Gentiles, right? As we saw. And this is another reason why I kind of think this happens before Acts 15. Because as we read through Acts 15, which we'll do, it doesn't seem like a time where afterward Peter would do something like this or James would send these people among the people that he's sending out to Antioch. 
Instead, this incident really seems more like a catalyst for Acts 15 to take place. So let's look at it. Paul has just finished up his first missionary journey, and he's returned to Antioch, and he shares about God's work with the Gentiles and God's work in the Gentiles. And then we get to this. It says, uh, But some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses... You cannot be saved. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about this question. So, being sent on their way by the church, they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles and brought great joy to all the brothers. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they declared all that God had done with them. But some believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees rose up and said, it is necessary to circumcise them and to order them to keep the law of Moses. That's the main problem here. And it's the main problem in Galatians. The apostles and the elders were gathered together to consider this matter. And after there had been much debate, Peter stood up. So here's Peter, and in front of everyone, he gives this answer that shows that he doesn't seem very afraid. He doesn't seem very afraid. Now, it's possible that he got afraid later, but after a speech like this, it it really almost seems like he wouldn't have had, I don't know, that kind of fear in front of this group. Uh, Again, So let's read what he says. Peter stood up and said to them, Brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you, that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us, and he made no distinction between us and them. He made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. By what? By faith. Right? Not works of the law. No. Faith. Now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? We can't even keep up this law. But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. Hearts cleansed by faith, saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus. It lines up very well with Paul's words in Ephesians. By grace you have been saved through faith. It's not your your own doing. Not a result of works, right? So Peter backs Paul's position. Right? You do not need to be circumcised physically in order to be saved. And all the assembly fell silent, and they listened to Barnabas and Paul. So right there, Peter stands up, and now Paul and Barnabas are being taken seriously. They listened to Barnabas and Paul as they related what signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. After they finished speaking, James, who again would be Jesus' half-brother, James, replied, Brothers, listen to me. Simeon, so Simon, Peter, has related how God first visited the Gentiles to take from them a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written, After this, I will return, and I will rebuild the tent of David that has fallen. I will rebuild its ruins, and I will restore it, that the remnant of mankind may seek the Lord, and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who makes these things known from of old. Therefore, my judgment is that we should not trouble Those of the Gentiles who turn to God. We should not trouble them, but should write to them to abstain from the things polluted by idols and from sexual immorality and from what has been strangled and from blood. For from ancient generations, Moses has had in every city those who proclaim him. For he has read every Sabbath in the synagogues, 
So this does not seem, and I, and I could be wrong, right? But it doesn't seem like someone who would send people to Antioch that would bring pressure on Peter to not eat with Gentiles. It's possible, but it just seems very unlikely, especially since, as we'll see next week, this incident brings Paul into his big section on how we are not saved by works of the law, but rather by faith in Christ. If we look at our Galatians passage again, starting in verse 11 again, Paul says, But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. Peter was eating with the Gentiles, just like he probably would have after having that, you know, kind of dream of rise, Peter, kill and eat, and then meeting with Cornelius and seeing the Holy Spirit come to the uncircumcised, to the Gentiles. And it says, but when they came, so when the men of Gen- James came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. It almost reminds you of like when Peter denied Jesus. You know, there are times where Peter's fear really defines him. Others where he shows great faith, of course, but there are very, very highlighted times where Peter's fear gets to the, it really gets to him, it gets the better of him, and we see him give into temptation. Here, it causes him to act hypocritically, right? Eating with the Gentiles is fine until James's men show up. And because he is influential, he's, right, the apostle upon whom Christ built his church, he's got this huge prominent position. It makes sense, then, that we see the rest of the Jews follow suit, right? It says, and the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him. Right? Oh, this is, this is our leader of the church. This is what he's doing. We better follow. So that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. Paul, though, of course, stuck to his guns. Right? But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, If you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force, force, the Gentiles to live like Jews? How can you Judaize them? And that question especially leads into next week's not being saved by works of the law, but through faith in Christ uh, message. And again, it just makes it seem like this isn't something that Peter would do after he had laid out that Gentiles saved by grace through faith message before James himself and the party of the Pharisees who said this salvation by circumcision stuff. And especially James, after James had said, we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God. There's just a lot more that seems to line up with Acts 11 uh, than it seems that lines up with Acts 15. I still have my fair share of questions between both sides of the debate, but I definitely find myself leaning Acts 11. Shifting to the heart of this message, though, we look at the inclusivity of the gospel. Inclusivity. It's, again, exclusive because you need to accept it, but it's inclusive as in anyone can. Jew or non-Jew, right? Slave or not. Male or female. It doesn't matter your ethnicity or your sex or your status. Everyone has the opportunity to accept the gospel, and nobody should be treated in the church as second class. You might see preachers and pastors or other elders sometimes treated as if they're more important than the others in the church because I think sometimes we confuse authority with greatness. You know, in the church there are those with higher authority than others, but does that make them better? I really hope nobody here thinks that they're better than anyone else. Even the unbelievers. You're better than no one. That's the truth of it. You're better than no one. I'm better than no one. We are what we are by the grace of God. He's the one who's better. Nobody should be treated and nobody should be seen as second class in the church. The people in authority at churches who treat people as if they're second class are not good leaders. Now, if church authority makes a decision that you don't agree with, That's not treating you like second class. But what you'll see sometimes in churches is 
maybe this sense of like pride or entitlement that the leadership feels they have since they're in the authoritative position. And it never feels good to be, you know, looked down on, right? Especially when you can feel that people think that they're better than you. And if that's how you're seen, and that's how you're treated, church becomes somewhere that you don't really want to be. It can cause people to walk away if they're made to feel inferior than others. We need to understand that in the church, no matter your role, you're equal in value. If we don't treat each other that way, then we're misrepresenting the gospel. As genuine Christians, we're all one in Christ Jesus. Paul makes this point in the next chapter. The famous verse that we alluded to earlier, Galatians 3.28, says there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither, there's, there's no male and female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. You're all equal in value. You're all one in Christ. Now the other thing to note is that, and I, and I think we all agree with this, right? Everyone is equal in value. But the other thing to note, are there ways in which we might hold to that truth, everyone's equal in value, yet maybe even unknowingly still go against it? We know the truth, but we still go against it. I had a friend in school who, when you hung out with him one-on-one, -on -one, he was great to you. You know, he was uh, really nice, he was understanding, but I also remember times where around others who wouldn't treat me very well, he would join them because the group's opinion of him was what he valued more. He wanted to be more popular in, in their eyes. And as much as I didn't like that, I understood it because way back, I also knew what I was like. You know, when people had treated others poorly, as much as I didn't join in the insults, I joined in the laughter at their expense, which is just as bad. I had that same desire. Be well liked. Don't go against the grain. And I feel like I see this in Peter. He's someone who agrees with the fact that the Jews and Gentiles can eat together, but when push comes to shove, he does not stick with his personal convictions due to fearing the opinions of man. He doesn't want to go against the grain. And by doing that, separating himself from the Gentiles, he brings an inconsistency to the gospel that he represents. It serves to show the Gentiles, hey, we're not actually one in Christ Jesus. You can't sit with us. So Paul delivers an open rebuke. In front of everyone, he gives a rebuke. Not because Peter is preaching something false with his words. I'm sure if pressed, Peter was at, he would actually explain himself in the right way, like he did at the beginning of Acts 11. In verses 2 and 4, verses 2 to 4, sorry, it says, So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcision party, the same people he fears in this passage we're going through, the circumcision party criticized him, saying, You went to uncircumcised men and ate with them. But Peter began and explained it to them in order. He ends up explaining the whole Cornelius situation as this verse happens right when he was returning from that. I think during the events of Galatians 2, if pressed, Peter would have spoke the truth. But I don't think he wanted to be pressed. I think he just wanted to avoid the whole thing and please the circumcision party. So in front of everyone... After he separates himself from the Gentiles, Paul gives that open rebuke, right? Again, not because Peter is preaching something false with his words, but because he's preaching something false with his actions. And we all know that, that so often actions speak louder than words. So Paul rebukes him in front of everyone, saying at the end of verse 14, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? Because that's what's taken from Peter's actions. That's what he's acting like, as if he would force them to become Jews. He all of a sudden only eats with Jews, right? The rest of the Jews follow suit. 
Even Barnabas is led astray. And now you have all these Gentiles thinking, wow, maybe I do need to be Judaized. Maybe I do need to live according to the law now. This is, this is who Christ set up to lead his church. Maybe I don't measure up to these chosen people of God if I'm not circumcised, if I don't follow their law. So it's good on Paul and glory to God working through him that Paul held fast to the gospel he knew was from Jesus and called Peter out in front of everyone. And I want to emphasize that. In front of everyone. In front of everyone. Before them all, right? You know, we're a local church. And we can deal with each other <clears throat> in a way that if someone has sinned against you, you go to each other personally, right? Personally, without airing it before everyone on Sunday morning or anything like that, right? Now, if there's consistent unrepentance, then it would be, you know, have two or three come with you. And if that doesn't work, then bring it before the members of the church. But one thing that I've seen recently is people taking those steps and applying it to extremely, extremely prominent teachers. For example, there's a Christian in California. His name is Mike Winger. And he recently made a video about a very prominent speaker named Benny Hinn. And how his false teaching, his false prophecy, his taking advantage of people's financial situation and his unrepentance was a very dangerous thing to the truth of the gospel and how people perceive Christians. Because they're just thinking, oh man, these guys just want my money. These guys are just greedy. And Mike was told when he put that video up, hey, you can't just air this out. Right? You need to go to him directly. You need to speak to him personally. But the thing is, Benny Hinn is so prominent. And in Africa, like his popularity is actually growing like wildfire. So he has this huge influence. This is not just local church stuff. Right? This is thousands and thousands of people being taken advantage of and led astray. And I think of what Mike did, and it reminds me of Paul. Right? Here is Peter, the rock upon whom Christ was building his church, seemingly the most prominent of the twelve apostles of Christ, leading Jews into hypocrisy so as to exclude the uncircumcised from fellowship. So Paul feels a public rebuke is necessary. And there are times for that, right? There are times where public rebuke is necessary. And because of Peter's prominent position here, it is an appropriate time for public rebuke to take place. The words of the gospel are of utmost importance, but so is the way that we live our lives. How are you at being inclusive? How are you at treating people? And does it look like Jesus? Does it line up with his gospel? Let's continue to seek the Lord in prayer and in his word and continue to lean on his Holy Spirit so that we can share the truth with our words and with our actions. We don't want to just, you know, use actions, right? We don't want to be playing charades with people. Oh, guess what the gospel is? I'm not going to tell you. I'll serve you, but I'm not going to say anything. Guess what the gospel is? No, we need words for sure. But at the same time, actions do speak louder than words. Actions help show that the one that we're sharing is worth surrendering our life to. Bow with me in prayer. Lord, thank you so much for your goodness toward us. We know the stories. We know the gospel, Lord. We know that you came down. You loved us so much that you died on the cross for our sins. You rose again. And so you made a way for us to come to heaven through faith. Genuine, repentant faith in your lordship. In your death for our sins. In your resurrection from the dead. We know that truth and it's so amazing. But Lord... 
We don't represent you that well. We don't represent that truth as well as we could. And sometimes we say it, right? We use our words. But we got to have our actions line up with those. So help us to do so because we want to do your name justice. We don't want to see people growing prominent and giving you a bad name, a bad taste in the mouth of those who don't know you so that they never come to know you. It's so important that we get this right. It's so important that we lean on you and your spirit within us to do a good job living our lives so that people see that you are good and that you're worth following. So please help us, Lord, in doing that. In the name of Jesus, amen.